Hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Coker. I am director of LSE Ideas, which is the London School of Economics Foreign Policy Think Tank. I'm very pleased that this meeting is being held in association with the Belgrade Centre for Security Policy. And it's also in association with the uh, RATU Forum and its program 2020 Visions. Back in the 1990s, uh, the only players in the Balkans were really the United States, uh, the European Union and Russia. Today, it's become a very crowded field, ranging from China on the one hand to the three countries that we're going to talk about uh, today, Turkey, Israel and the United Arab Emirates. And we'll be looking at the geopolitical implications of their involvement in the region. The speakers we have, I will now introduce uh, ahead uh, of their actual talks, uh, Demeter Betchev, who will be talking about Turkey, visiting fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Tina Trilic, who is a research fellow uh, at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Oxford. And Vuk Vuksanovic, who is a researcher at the Belgrade Center and also an associate of LSE Ideas. But before I, uh, the three speakers, uh, say their piece and they'll be limited to about 12 minutes each before we open it to q a and by the way please uh post up your questions so that i can select them when we get to the q a uh, section but before uh, the speakers uh, begin can i just introduce igor Andovich from the belgrade center for security policy and ask him to make a few remarks thank you professor cocker i want to thank you uh, really for this partnership and for the opportunity for us at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy to cooperate on this uh, very interesting and uh, really important topic in the Balkans. I'm glad that we have so many participants here who will hear about something which is not often um, uh, being the subject of the discussion in the Balkans. I'm glad that we will shed light on the, the role of of these three countries, and also on the important aspect of geopolitical considerations in the Balkans. Uh, I want to say just a few words about Belgrade Center for Security Policy, which is a think tank which was established in 1997. Uh, we celebrated 23 years of existence. Uh, we are dealing mostly with the security policies uh, of Serbia, but also of the region. Uh, we are working a lot on the foreign policy and nexus between security and foreign policy, but also we are covering uh, important aspects of rule of law, uh, European integration, and uh, democratic civilian control of armed forces and security forces in Serbia. Um, it is my great pleasure to be with you, and I hope that we will uh, continue our cooperation in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, can we turn to our first panelist, Dimitra, would you like to um, tell us about Turkey's involvement in the Balkans? Thank you, Christopher, and thanks to LSE Ideas and the Belgrade uh, Security um, Forum for organizing uh, this timely event. Uh, I have four points to make, and I'll uh, try to make it very brief and conscious of uh, the time limits. Uh, the first one is that Turkey is part of the Balkans, unlike the other two uh, in, in um, countries covered uh, in this uh, conversation. My second point is that uh, it's not back to the region. In fact, it has always been there and even more so, maybe uh, at the risk of contradicting uh, the chair, uh, its presence dates back to the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. Uh, thirdly, I want to discuss um, what uh, Erdogan factor, uh, uh, what difference the Erdogan factor makes. Uh, makes in the Balkans, and finally to touch on how Turkey and the West interact uh, in the region. So why Turkey is part of the Balkans? Well, you can look at geography. Um, part of Turkey is uh, in Southeast Europe. Uh, Istanbul is the biggest conurbation in this uh, larger region, but also uh, there's this human connectivity factor. Uh, about one third of the population of Turkey has roots uh, in, from what used to be the, the Ottoman Empire in the region. And mind you, the Balkans was not the periphery, it was very much the core of the empire, especially parts of the Balkans towards the east. And even now, some parts of Turkey, uh, the borders of Iran, uh, 
uh, in Iraq are much further um, geographically than uh, key uh, cities uh, and areas uh, of, of the, the region. Um, the presence of uh, um, commercial connections with uh, Romania, Bulgaria, but also Greece being large commercial partners, uh, Istanbul Airport, uh, a big uh, regional hub, um, and even uh, diasporas make a difference. So when Vucic and Erdogan went to Novi Pazar uh, two years ago, um, they were greeted by a local crowd. And these people in the Sanjak, typically they have family, they visit Turkey on a regular basis. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, personal connections to Turkey. So this human geographical, economic and political connectivity uh, puts Turkey in a very diff diff different uh, basket. Uh, than uh, either Russia and China, and certainly uh, different from uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, and Israel. Uh, it's an interesting question while we bundle together uh, uh, Turkey with those two. It has to do, of course, with activist foreign policy Erdogan, Erdogan embarked upon putting Turkey in the Middle East. But the uh, important caveat is that Turkey belongs to several regions. It's, it's a Balkan country, it's a Middle Eastern country, but it's also part of the Caucasus. And this multi-vector, multi-regional um, essence of Turkey uh, kind of feeds into its foreign policy. But we shouldn't forget uh, its embeddedness in the Balkans, which sets it apart. Uh, now, obviously, politics uh, is, is part of it. And if you think about the 1990s, uh, it was the end of the Cold War. And Turgut Özal, who, by the way, was the pioneering uh, voice in, in shaping this neighborhood policy, uh, he put Turkey on the map. He initiated the debate about intervention in Bosnia. And of course, back then, uh, it was Hikmet Çetin who uh, was the foreign minister who favored a multilateral approach, so Turkey should act through NATO. And that was what uh, remained in place. But the point is that Turkey was part of the institutional arrangements. It uh, was involved in peacekeeping. It uh, got a seat in the Peace Implementation Council uh, in Bosnia. It supported uh, NATO uh, and, of course, EU enlargement, and it's a different topic I'll uh, come back to. Uh, and also it was part of um, um, all different regional initiatives uh, in the mid-90s towards uh, to, until present, where actually the region got together, the Southeastern European cooperation process, the stability pact. Turkey always had a seat at the table, which fed into the definition that it's uh, a Balkan country as well as uh, Part of other uh, regions. Uh, Turkey developed a very uh, close political and defense ties to some Balkan countries, uh, Albania and then Macedonia, because remember that was the time when Turkey was rivaling with Greece and all those new players in the region were welcome partners in, in balancing against, against Greece. Um, and uh, it, it kind of it was always present uh, in the regional balance of power one way or the other. You can even go back in time with the first and the second Balkan Pact. We don't need to do that. Uh, and finally, um, Turkish uh, presence in the way of developmental assistance, uh, the TICA, which is the developmental arm of, of Turkey, now very prominent under Erdogan, goes back to the early 90s, uh, as does uh, the Director of, the, of Religious Affairs, the DNET. It became involved in uh, Muslim uh, majority countries, also Muslim communities, uh, in the aftermath of the Bosnian War, uh, as a way to counter the influence of uh, Salafism coming from the Gulf. And uh, now it's much more prominent uh, because it's part of uh, the foreign policy, it's put uh, at the forefront, but it's not something that Erdogan came up with. Uh, it has been around for, for quite some time. So all the tenets of Turkish presence were already implicitly there by the, by the time the AKP took power. Now, what is the difference that Erdogan made? Um, well, obviously, the rhetoric uh, around Turkish foreign policy has changed. So Turkey has reinvented itself from kind of a difficult partner of the West into um, a freestanding um foreign policy player, which is equidistant from both the West, Russia and other centers of power. So it's an ambitious player. Islam has become much more important. Um, the Turkey styles itself as a leader of Sunni Muslims, not just in Europe and the Middle East, but also worldwide. 
And that was a tricky subject for the previous elites who, of course, saw uh, Turkish, Mus Turkish Muslimness as, as a liability rather than an asset and, and critical to its identity. Uh, Erdogan's rhetoric has been very uh, much anti-Western, um, of course, and he has played up uh, those, those teams as, as Turkey as a counterweight. Uh, a very good example would be uh, his um, trip to Sarajevo uh, amidst the pre-election campaign in 2018, when, of course, there was a, uh, a jumbo election, parliamentary as well, presidential in Turkey. Uh, he was banned as well, his ministers were banned from campaigning in, in Western Europe. And lo and behold, he turned up in Sarajevo, where, of course, nobody from the, the local elites could say no to him. And he rallied uh, both Balkan Muslims, but even more importantly, Turkish diaspora uh, from countries like Germany and Austria. Um, and Sarajevo being in the middle between Turkey and, and, and Western Europe was a very uh, convenient place to, to hold this rally. So um, the Balkans um, has become part and parcel of this um, attempt to portray Turkey as an alternative a counterweight to the West and to uh, rally uh, th those sentiments. And finally, personalization. Um, Turkish policy has become much more centered on the leaders' relationship to other leaders in the region. In the old days, uh, with different governments rotating in Ankara, it was difficult. Uh, to envision such a scenario. Uh, of course, power was exercised by other institutions. Um, policymaking worked differently. Now, informality, um, the kind of relationship Erdogan enjoys with people like Alexander Vucic of Serbia, and that's an important uh, theme. I probably I, I don't have much time to go into it, maybe in the Q&A, uh, Turkey and Serbia, but also with Edi Rama, of Albania with uh, Boyko Borisov of Bulgaria, who was incidentally one of the people arguing for a uh, that kind of uh, softer sanctions or even uh, opposing the idea of sanctions because of Turkish policies in the Eastern Mediterranean when the discussion came to, to, to Brussels. Uh, so personalization has become a key theme. So that was my third point. Third one has changed the rhetoric around Turkish foreign policy and, and some, of, uh, some of the substance as well. But um, I'll, my last point is that Turkey is not necessarily a, a rival of the West, or maybe it's, it is a rival, but not in the way that uh, Russia, which is usually um, singled out as, as a doppelganger, is. Uh, Turkey doesn't have a spoiler role uh, in the region. It has supported NATO enlargement in the case of Montenegro, as well uh, as in the case of North Macedonia. It's still kind of implicitly in favor of the EU. And also, uh, if you look at the commercial side of Turkish presence, uh, a lot of uh, ink has been spilled on Turkey, uh, signing free trade agreements with Bosnia, with Serbia, with uh, all the different Western Balkan countries. But the main trading partners of Turkey are in the Eastern Balkans, starting with Romania, just because of the sheer size of its market, as well as Bulgaria and Greece. And there's a very simple reason. These are countries part of the EU and the customs union in, in place between the EU and Turkey is an important factor for the Turkish economy, allowing for uh, smooth uh, trade uh, in, in, in goods. Um, if you're a Turkish exporter, you can set up shop pretty easily but also import from, from those countries. It's not for um, incidental that uh, if you look at uh, Serbia, Bosnia and the rest, they import from Turkey, but they don't uh, export that much. Whereas EU members in the region actually have balanced trade uh, with Turkey. And that counts for something. Um, so NATO, the EU factor, but also one other area, that's my last uh, point uh, here on the uh, Turkey in the West, is, is energy. Um, now, uh, in November, we saw uh, the opening of the South Gas Corridor, and Turkey has been part and parcel uh, in this discussion since uh, the 90s. And it has now become a transit country for, for Caspian gas. Uh, and that's the idea that has been in the making uh, for a long, long time. So the key to diversification of energy supplies, uh, in at least gas, uh, in uh, Southeast Europe and the Western Balkans in particular, goes through Turkey, and Turkey is very much on the same page as the US uh, and the EU, I would submit. So um, essentially Turkey uh, wants to be independent, 
wants to be equidistant from uh, the East and the West and, and play its whole game. But uh, I think a, a lot of connections to the West are still in place and that shapes uh, Turkish presence uh, in the region. Thank you very much, um, Numita. And one of the, you did correct me about um, Turkey's long-standing uh, presence in, in the Balkans. And w one question that you might want to address in the Q&A, not now, is, is, is the extent to which historical memory and historical consciousness is both a plus and, and, and perhaps a minus as well. And we used to hear much less so now than we did uh, two years ago about an, a renewed Ottoman uh, foreign policy. And I think that, that is not a favoured phrase now in Turkey for obvious reasons. It does kindle memories or rekindle memories of, of the past. But anyway, you might want to just address that in the Q&A session. Let's uh, move on, if we may, to the United Arab Emirates. Tina. Thank you so much, Christopher, and thank you to all the organizers of, uh, of this panel. It's a real pleasure to be with all you once again. Um, although virtually, I do hope that uh, better times will, will come soon when we'll be able to, to gather uh, in, in person. So I'll start with my, my presentation with a caveat, uh, which is that uh, I approach this subject of the relations between the UAE and the Balkans as somebody whose main region of expertise is Southeastern Europe. So uh, I'll be focusing most of all on the role of the, of the Western Balkans in this interaction. And I do look forward to your comments and your questions. Uh, so I do encourage you to, to write about uh, what you think that this all means for the UAE and the Middle East um, uh, in, in the comments. So when I first started uh, uh, approaching this uh, topic of uh, UAE-Balkans relations back in 2015, um, we were lucky enough to be given support from the LSE Middle East uh, uh, Center, uh, me and my colleagues from uh, DC Research on Southeastern Europe. Uh, and uh, alongside uh, Will Bartlett and James Kerlinzi, we started looking into this topic. Um, this was a relatively new hot topic um, in the Balkans because it had been in the news, especially in Serbia uh, from 2013, 2014, more or less. Uh, alongside with the ascent to power of uh, uh, Mr. Aleksandar Vucic, who is currently the, the president of, uh, of Serbia and back then was uh, the deputy prime minister and then becoming uh, prime minister. Uh, so our mandate um, then in 2015 was to analyze uh, how the use of foreign aid um, happened from the side of the UAE in the Balkans. So it was part of a larger uh, study that was seeing, looking at how the UAE were using foreign aid in several regions of the world. Uh, but soon enough, we understood that foreign aid uh, intended as uh, the international transport of goods and services for the benefit of a population, so basically a charitable enterprise, did not quite fit uh, in terms of this new relationship between the Emirates and the Balkans. Uh, in fact, there was very little charitable about uh, these investments. It was much more about the business component, the commercial perspective, uh, as we found out uh, very soon. So this financial involvement of the UAE in Southeastern Europe is not entirely a new phenomenon. And to a certain extent, there was um, some sort of um, uh, foreign aid element during the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, mainly in countries such as Kosovo and Bosnia, so uh, Muslim majority countries, um, uh, intended as uh, post-war foreign aid. However, these interests that have developed over the past uh, decade or so, uh, let's say since 2008, 2010, uh, most uh, prominently, um, were a bit of a different ball game. Um, if we go even back in time, um, we see that uh, during Tito's time, so during former Yugoslavia, there were some ties between uh, former Yugoslavia and the Emirates under uh, the framework of the non-aligned movement, because the UAE were also, um, were also part of the non-aligned movement. And suddenly in the 2010s, these links were revived. So when we compare that during the 1990s, um, Sheikh um, Zayed al Nakhyan, uh, who was the ruler of uh, Abu Dhabi, the most powerful of uh, uh, the Emirates. Um, so during the 1990s, Sheikh Zayed uh, was very, very clear in calling for the UN to recognize genocide in Bosnia as perpetrated by Serbia. So the relations were clearly very, very, very 
tense between the two countries. And when you think that two decades afterwards, uh, his son, uh, Mohammed, uh, was uh, very much uh, friends with, uh, um, uh, with the, the, the government and the highest politicians in Serbia, you can see that uh, there was quite a big overhaul in relationships between the two. So what happened? Um, we were lucky enough to uh, been given access to some officers and even business people from the UAE um, when we started this this research. So I will tell you now first the official reasons uh, for engagement. So from the UAE's perspective, um, they highlight very much this long-term investment philosophy, the need for a diversification of their economy for a post-oil future. So they highlight the fact that whereas uh, Western investors uh, look for return on investment of uh, two, three, four years maximum, what they're doing is a long-term planning, looking uh, to a 50-year framework, uh, really looking into the future. Furthermore, they highlight that they are completely geographically agnostic. Uh, so they say that uh, uh, they don't uh, look at uh, one specific region or the other, that their aim is in general to make friends around the globe. Um, furthermore, uh, their interest was to set foot in these markets, in the EU accession countries, before they joined the EU therefore opening up to a much larger market. And this is quite interesting to highlight because usually um, this discourse of the external actors in the Balkans is accompanied by this uh, um, uh, worldview, different you know, clash of worldviews type of argument. Whereas in this case, uh, from this official perspective, there is no clash actually, the two are compatible. So EU accession goes hand in hand with the UAE's motivations too. And then, uh, importantly, the sectors of investment where the UAE decided to invest uh, in the Balkans, in Montenegro first, then in Serbia, and then more and more also in Bosnia and in other countries, um, are seen as a rational extension of their existing strategy. Uh, so there is um, uh, food security, so they invested in agriculture to ensure that they have food for, for the long term, uh, which is of course uh, scarce in, uh, in the Middle East, in that part of the world. Um, they need to secure defense resources because they are in a very unstable part of, of the world. Uh, then airlines, um, they, they have the super connector strategy with uh, the airport of uh, uh, Dubai in the middle and therefore they say that uh, overtaking airlines um, in, in various strategic places in the world fits within their strategy. And finally, um, the high-end construction on, and luxury goods is also something that they are very skilled in. If you think that uh, uh, the, the place where Dubai rises now uh, 30, 40 years ago was basically desert. So they say we're really skilled in that and we can make uh, a, big, a big impact in that sense. And aside from these, uh, they also do not hide certain cultural matches. So um, you officials told me, uh, so they said, you know, in the, in the Emirates, in the Middle East, we have the concept of majlis. Uh, so of this informal um, gatherings where the ruler speaks to, to the citizens. Um, so they say we do like the informality here because, you know, when you, when you uh, want to meet an official from the government, you just pick up the phone and it's easy to agree. So this also fits with uh, what, um, uh, what uh, Dimitar was mentioning earlier on, that this uh, personalized type of relationship is, is important in, in the way that relations have, have developed. So what's in it in the Balkans? I mean, very clearly, uh, the Balkan countries do need injections of capital, especially after the very big economic crisis that, uh, that happened in 2008. And uh, of course, now there is a, there is a huge one uh, already uh, around the corner with the COVID-19. So they do need injections of capital and all the economic analysis that you read, the macroeconomic analysis, they say that FDI is, is really important in that sense. And furthermore, if you think about, you know, what are the deals that can be made in the Balkans? There are no quick deals, really. There are not many investments of those Western type, a quick ROI that, that are preferred by, I don't know, Frankfurt, London, New York. There is a need for somebody with this long-term engagement. So this perspective was one that is shared and that is, that is of, of mutual benefit. 
So this, you know, this narrative of mutual benefit is one that emerges very, very clearly um, as the guiding uh, uh, principle in, uh, in the relations between the two. I would add to all this one more, which is part of um, the analysis that I presented last time in this, uh, in this discussion series, which is this narrative of economic salvation that some Balkan rulers um, had uh, utilized for their own political ends. So I've analyzed the example of Serbia, um, showing how, you know, if you look at the media coverage at that point, this uh, um, benef beneficial impact of the money coming from the United Arab Emirates was incredibly highlighted in the first years of this, of this engagement, especially in 2013, 14, 15. And this was somehow a way for also the Balkan rulers to present themselves as uh, as able to save the situation from a difficult, save the, the citizenship from a difficult economic situation. So, so far, so good. Um, and yet there are, there are several worrying elements. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it is the fact that uh, most of these uh, uh, investments, they are carried out through state level agreements. So this is most clearly uh, once again uh, seen in Serbia when there is, where there was a, um, a very wide ranging state level agreement between, uh, between the UAE and, uh, and the Serbian government. But it's also proposed in some form or another in the other countries of the Balkans where the United Arab Emirates are, are present. So the thing is, if you make, if you enshrine these investments within a state level agreement, then they are marked as, uh, as deals of national interest. And that allows the government, the Balkan governments, to basically wall off the population and not give any, any information that they do not want to give. So this, this is really um, one very, very worrying aspect, the non-transparency of these deals. Furthermore, we already saw that uh, these deals are highly personalized so that there is much uh, um, that the the picture is one of relations at the top that uh, uh, that make them uh, uh, make them happen and uh, anybody who will have touched will have googled this uh, um, this topic online will have seen that uh, there there is a lot of discussion about the possible intermediary that has kind of brought these uh, um, uh, the, the the rulers from Abu Dhabi in contact with the Balkan rulers uh, and this person is uh, Mohammed Dahlan a Palestinian um, national so this person was uh, also given um, uh, passports from both the governments of uh, of Serbia and Montenegro. So although both the Emirati and uh, Serbia and Montenegro foresee that there is nothing to it, that this is not uh, um, that the relationship between these countries are not uh, driven by a single person, we can see that um, uh, that 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 this uh, instance of you know giving away citizenship to not only um, this specific person, but also to a cohort of ex actors around them, is something that uh, uh, that makes us worry. Um, so, in each of the sectors of specialization that I mentioned earlier, there have been very many controversies. You have heard about Belgrade Waterfront and about the demolition of uh, the houses uh, to make space for this luxury construction in the middle of uh, um, of, uh, of Belgrade. Um, the agricultural deals are surrounded by quite a lot of, uh, of controversy uh, and in general um, both those and uh, the airplane deals are, uh, are said to have been at the end of the day um, a cost that has been suffered by the coffers of the uh, Balkan states and we can go more into it later if there is, if there is interest. And one really worrying uh, sector really is, is defense. So a document that I obtained from the Serbian Cham Chamber of Commerce um, two years ago now uh, said that uh, the export from Serbia to the UAE consists mainly of weapons. So 67% of exports from Serbia to the UAE are related to the defense sector. This is quite significant when you also think that uh, at least 3 million pieces of Serbian weapons have found their way to both Yemen and Syria over the past three years. So this uh, 
non-transparency of all the deals also raises big questions about security and the possible involvement in um, in these uh, in, uh, in in the in the you know Balkan weapons ending up even even in war zones, which is of course very very worrying. So, um, in terms of, of uh, the narrative uh, that I uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, this political narrative of uh, the Emirati saviors, I would argue that uh, this need now is a bit muted. So there is not so much need for them to be so highlighted in the news anymore. You will see if you follow uh, the news in this in this region that uh, um, this is not so much uh, uh, a hot topic any longer. But I would argue that these deals have been started and they are sort of, uh, for the most part, they are uh, they are being followed through. It is just the political narrative that is not so needed um, anymore. Uh, however, all those uh, um, instances that I mentioned about the uh, non-transparency, about the, uh, the governments of the Western Balkans giving subventions to, to these deals, about the unclear sorts of, of funds, they all raise a lot of red flags. So in corruption literature, it would really send um, alarm bells ringing in terms of uh, what the relationship there is, is really. And uh, these are even more worrying when you when you think uh, of uh, all the issues that surround the role of uh, the Emirates and especially Dubai in the global dynamics of uh, corruption. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, I warmly recommend a recent uh, report by Matthew Page and Jody Vittori that really flashes it out uh, uh, in which ways uh, the Emirates uh, might be involved uh, as, a, uh, as a place where, um, where money laundering uh, um, is uh, is uh, prospers in in a way or the other or that facilitates uh, money laundering. So um, these all these issues really uh, throw a shade on this narrative of uh, mutual benefit that was pushed in the official uh, in the official um, statements of uh, of the of the politician. And the big question really is for whose benefit exactly. So we still do not have the answers to some very big questions for many of these deals. Who are exactly the people behind them and where the money comes from? What is the source of money? So the state in the Western Balkans, for the most part, will tell you that this is a matter of national security because of the way that these deals are enshrined in, in, in law. But I would argue that it's really a matter of uh, maybe even national security for the citizens of these countries that these answers are given because they raise very many, very many questions. So really radical transparency is, is an important point. And I do think to conclude that uh, uh, the, both the EU and the US should push for this radical transparency. If the EU accession conditionality carrot is not enough in this moment, which uh, unfortunately is likely, then I think that uh, uh, this should be made conditional upon any financial benefits or any other kind of, uh, of uh, financial assistance or interaction between the two. And I hope that at least in the US, now with the new um, administration and with Tony Blinken um, taking an important role, um, there will be an appetite to go along this route. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, two, two questions that I would um, ask you to consider for the Q&A, not now, is the extent to which the UAE finds itself in competition with Qatar, uh, at all in the region? Is this a, a factor um, since the, the two have very bad relations uh, in the past uh, few years? And secondly, as you said, um, the EU is very keen on what they call values-based investment, uh, labor relations, environmental regulations, etc. Is there anything like that uh, in which religion plays a, a part? Uh, minorities, uh, religious opinions, uh, do these factor at all? And these investments are those just largely absent? Anyway, you may or may not want to address those uh, in the Q&A. Can I move on to VOOP? Because uh, one of the uh, achievements, it's often been said, uh, of the Trump foreign policy was to get the UAE and Israel uh, talking uh, together. And so you're going to talk about Israel and its uh, place in the Balkans. So I think it's a nice segue into your book. Over to you, VOOP. Thank you very much, Christopher. Thanks to Dimitar and Tana for uh, raising uh, the bar very highly. So I have to say that uh, for the past 10 years ago, I've uh, noticed that uh, Israel has uh, increased its uh, foreign policy activities in the Balkans. 
And uh, I did so at the time when I was uh, still an inexperienced uh, LSE master's student. So before I had the uh, academic and uh, professional credentials that I have uh, today. So the fact that I uh, started writing about it uh, several years uh, later really uh, boosted my uh, personal and professional ego for that matter. However, the fact that uh, not many people have uh, noticed uh, Israel's uh, increased uh, foreign policy in the region uh, speaks of the fact that uh, Israel likes to cultivate uh, its friendship in the regions uh, quietly, as an economist uh, piece uh, called this phenomenon two years ago. Now, uh, I have to stress that uh, Israeli foreign policy in the Balkans revolves around uh, two major themes. First one is uh, how to weaken uh, the EU's uh, stance on the Palestinian issues. And uh, the second theme is uh, a major change in the Israeli foreign policy doctrine, a major change in its uh, national security foreign, foreign policy uh, doctrine. Now, on, on the first point, on the Palestinian issue and the EU, now, as a supporter of a two-state solution, uh, the EU has been a thorn is in uh, Israel's uh, side for a very long time. And so Israel believed that by making overtures towards the nations of the Southeastern Europe, where, mo where some countries are a member of the EU and some of them are EU membership uh, candidates, they believe that they can weaken uh, EU's ability to have a unified uh, policy towards uh, the Palestinian issue. Uh, this happened uh, in 2011 when Israel started uh, lobbying with the local uh, nations. And uh, in 2012, there was a vote to give uh, a non-member state to Palestine in the UN General Assembly. On that point, uh, the Romania and Bulgaria abstained from that vote. And uh, so did Bosnia. Why? Because uh, Avigdor Lieberman, who was at that time Israeli foreign minister, spent several uh, weeks on a vacation in Banja Luka, which is the capital of uh, Republika Srpska, Serbian entity in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which resulted in the fact that Republika Srpska vetoes the Bosnian decision to endorse Palestinian uh, bid in the UN. Uh, in uh, May 2018, uh, two countries of uh, Southeastern Europe, Hungary and Romania, alongside another Eastern European country, which is not from the Balkans and Southeastern Europe, Czech Republic, the three broke uh, ranks with the European Union as they've uh, sent their envoys to the festivities which surrounded uh, the US uh, embassy move uh, to Jerusalem. And uh, in November 2018, we had a quadrilateral uh, regional meeting, the so-called uh, Krajova Group uh, Summit, which was held in uh, Varna, uh, Bulgaria. It is a regional grouping which uh, gathers uh, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Serbia and Greece. And uh, for the first time, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was a visit of this gathering. And on that point, he even uh, bashed the uh, hypocritical and uh, hostile uh, attitude towards uh, Israel. So that's uh, point number one about Israeli foreign policy in the Balkans. However, there is a wider uh, strategic context which relates to the fact that uh, Israel has increased its uh, activities in the Balkans as a response to, uh, it, to the change in its uh, regional strategic uh, environment. Now, when Israel was formed, it applied what was usually called the Periphery Doctrine, or uh, Gurion's Doctrine, named after the first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. Namely, as Israel was uh, surrounded during the Cold War with uh, hostile Arab neighbors, they had to compensate this fact by overreaching further to the, to the non-Arab uh, Islamic uh, countries, which in this case involved uh, Kemalist Turkey and uh, Shah of Iran. However, as the situation became uh, very bad uh, back in 2011. Now, the relationship between Israel and Iran were already uh, hostile. I mean, and not only did they have hostile relationship with Iran, but also with its, uh, with its uh, two allies, uh, the Assad regime in Damascus and the uh, Lebanese uh, Hezbollah. And there was, all, of course, we all remember that was the height of the fear about the uh, Iranian nuclear program. However, what also happened in 2011 was first the Arab Spring, which created a large uh, strategic turmoil in its uh, Arab uh, periphery in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean. And the second one was the fo diplomatic fallout uh, with Turkey over the deadly Mavi Marmara raid. We all remember when Israeli special forces raided one of the, one of the Turkish ships which carried uh, aid uh, to Gaza. And uh, the Israeli soldiers opened fire and kill, uh, killed, I think it was nine Turkish uh, sailors. I mean, the diplomatic relations were even severed at one point beca because of uh, Israel's refusal uh, to apologize for this uh, incident. So as a result of that, Israel had to modify its uh, strategic doctrine and uh, expand its uh, periphery. 
to form uh, new alliances that entail the uh, players like China, India, Azerbaijan, Italy, but also last but not least, most important for this talk, uh, nations of uh, Southeastern uh, Europe. So uh, in 2012, Netanyahu visited uh, Cyprus for the first time in history that the Israeli Prime Minister visited Cyprus naturally as a response to Turkey's growing strategic clout in Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, that same year, we had a terrorist attack in Burgas in uh, Bulgaria in which there was uh, a terrorist attack carried out most likely by Hezbollah against uh, Israeli tourists in Bulgaria, which was both uh, a retaliation for the assassination of uh, Iranian nuclear scientists, as well as a retaliation for assassination of uh, Imad Mounier, who was uh, number two in Hezbollah command. He was assassinated by Mossad and CIA back in um, 2008. So this uh, increased uh, Israeli's interest in the Balkans as a place where uh, terrorist attacks against uh, Israeli targets are always possible and where there is, uh, of course, a network of uh, Islamic uh, intelligence agencies or uh, jihadist uh, groups. And as a result, we have seen Israel building up uh, partnerships with the local uh, countries. First, I mean, its primary partners are uh, Greece and uh, Cyprus. I have already mentioned that they have increased uh, their diplomatic ties, they are working together on exploration of uh, energy resources in the Eastern Mediterranean. Most recently, uh, in January this year, uh, there is a very lucrative uh, defense uh, contract which was signed between uh, Israel and the Greece government, 1.68, but where, uh, Greece, where Israeli defense company Elbit will be providing uh, training uh, aircrafts, and this is uh, supposed to increase the combat readiness of uh, Hellenic uh, Air Force. And uh, Elbit, this company is the same company which also trains uh, Macedonian uh, military helicopter uh, pilots. So having a diplomatic uh, presence in the Balkans for uh, Israel is uh, tempting and logical, given that uh, geography places many of the local uh, nations at the crossroads uh, between uh, East and West. Greece has maritime access to both uh, North uh, Africa and Middle East. Serbia connects the Balkan Peninsula with Central uh, Europe, and Romania and Bulgaria are Black Sea littoral countries that uh, open the door to places like the Caucasus and uh, Central Asia. Uh, in July 2018, Israeli president visited uh, Serbia, where he named the street in the Belgrade municipality of Zemun after Zionist ideologue uh, Theodor Herzl, whose uh, parents uh, lived there. It has also become a main diplomatic uh, backer of Serbian entity in uh, Republika Srpska, uh, in, of uh, Serbian entity Bosnia, Republika Srpska. Albanians uh, in both uh, Albania and uh, Kosovo avoid aligning themselves against Israel, both uh, to court Israel as well as to court uh, its main uh, great power backer, the United uh, States. And uh, is intelligence cooperation seems to have uh, increased between the Israelis and uh, local nations. However, I think that the pinnacle of um, Israeli uh, achievements in, uh, in the Balkans came in September 2020, when we had the White House agreement brokered by uh, Donald Trump's uh, administration between uh, Belgrade and Pristina. Now, Donald Trump, in his uh, failed attempt, in his uh, failed attempt to get uh, re-election, to try to, to connect the Balkans with issue which res resonates uh, much more deeply with his uh, own voters, which is uh, the middle, which is status of Israel. So according to these uh, provisions, Serbia was supposed to move its uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, while Israel uh, recognizes Kosovo and Kosovo in return opens up its uh, embassy in Jerusalem. As part of these uh, provisions, both sides are supposed to designate uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist uh, organization. So this was a great win for uh, ben Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, his governments. Uh, government. I can say that uh, Israeli foreign policy in the region has undergone a true full uh, renaissance with this agreement. Now, if, if, their, uh, if their aim is to weaken EU stance uh, on the Palestine issue, then I can say that uh, Serbia is a very big win because for decades Serbia prided itself of being neutral in Israel-Palestinian conflict and on being on uh, friendly terms with both uh, Israelis and the Palestinians. It has voted uh, in favor of uh, Palestinian membership in uh, UN and UNESCO, and uh, for it has also voted uh, against the US uh, on the issue of uh, their decision to move uh, embassy uh, to Jerusalem. So it has been a nice, uh, a nice point to score for uh, Israelis. And if uh, Israel wants to achieve a more robust presence in the Balkans, this is also a very good uh, score, given that with this agreement, uh, Israel has tied itself with two of the region's uh, strategically most consequential ethnic groups, which are uh, Serbs uh, and Albanians. 
so uh, I uh, I will uh, now uh, conclude. I uh, suspect that despite of talk that many are claiming that uh, the Biden uh, win will uh, will actually mean that uh, Serbia will not be moving its embassy to Jerusalem. I expect that this will be implemented because uh, Israel lobby will be a resource that uh, Serbia desperately needs, particularly as Belgrade is uh, very keen to get a diplomatic uh, protector uh, on. Uh, in regards to the U.S. because they expect that Biden administration would be mu will be much uh, tougher on Belgrade uh, on Kosovo issue than Trump. So they expect this not only, uh, not, not necessarily to get a better bargain, but if they not to get a better bargain, then at least uh, to ameliorate some of the potential uh, pressures. And I can also say that uh, Israeli status as uh, a new player in the Balkans has been uh, cemented now with this uh, White House uh, agreement. And uh, on that front, Israel is no anomaly. It has been uh, using a uh, power vacuum, uh, an opening, which was left uh, by the EU in action, just like about uh, everybody else for that matter. But, uh, they did, and this is my last point, uh, Israel does not have the capacity to achieve uh, a robust uh, presence in the Balkans but it is present in the region uh, just enough uh, to protect its interests. And I believe that the presence of diplomatic activities of players like uh, Israel are speaking about the new geopolitical uh, reality. That is that there is a growing interplay between the Balkans and the Middle East and that the two should uh, cease be view being uh, viewed as uh, two unrelated uh, strategic units. And uh, on that point, I will end and uh, leave it to the Q&A for the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vuk. I think these have all been uh, three fascinating presentations. Uh, as always, we are left with very little time for the Q&A. We have to conclude, unfortunately, in 10 minutes. <laughs> we have a number of questions. We won't be able to put them all. I've had to uh, rather unilaterally decide which I think are the three ones that should be answered um, within the time that we have available. The first is a question of Turkey's claim to be a Balkan country. Um, is this accepted by the Balkan powers? Do they feel uh, there's a little bit of historical leisure de mer here? Do they accept that it is a, a valid, that Turkey is a valid Balkan country? Or do they think that there's a bit of um, politicking going on? So that's uh, one question. Uh, on uh, the, the UAE um, authoritarianism, uh, insofar as perhaps the, the contract with uh, the UAE means ignoring some of the values-based uh, rules and regulations that the EU and, and the United States uh, often like. To what extent is this a plus or minus? Does this help the Balkans uh, move away from the West towards China and Russia? Is this the direction in which they may be going? And uh, for you, uh, uh, Vuk, Iran. Um, Iran uh, obviously is the enemy of all three countries we've been talking about, uh, Turkey, uh, Israel, and the UAE, at least at the moment, particularly with regard to Turkey, this, what's happening in Syria and Iran's involvement. So um, what is the Iranian presence uh, in the Balkans and how important is that going to be in the future? So can we just go through the order of the panelists, uh, beginning with Turkey, going on to the UAE? Just on the UAE, there was another question about the UAE's new agreement with Greece, uh, uh, defense agreement, and whether that is going to have uh, uh, important uh, implications for uh, Turkey's position in the region as well. So let's start with you, Dimitri. Thank you. Um, is Turkey accepted? Well, it's a region that nobody wants to be part of, or at least people try to escape. So having a country that wants to be in uh, is, 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 not, is not a politicized issue. It's not something that keeps people uh, at, uh, up at night or generates headlines. Uh, on the country, and for, for Greece and Bulgaria, Turkey is out there. I mean, if if you have a refugee crisis, uh, it, it cannot uh, double in this academic issue whether Turkey is, is, is your neighbor or, or not. It might be a bit different with the Western Balkans, uh, but even there, I think there is a welcoming uh, attitude. And again, uh, I couldn't talk much about Serbia and Turkey, but I think that's that's, that's a novel element, the fact that Serbia and um, no, no, no one else but Milosevic is uh, Minister of Information, right? Uh, that's uh, what, uh, Vucic's first position in government. Now has become Turkey's best friend uh, uh, in the region. And I don't see it uh, being a contentious issue. Uh, Turkey delivering uh, economic assistance or, or, or uh, COVID uh, hasn't been um, 
I think that the big issue was uh, uh, around uh, what role Turkey plays in the region rather than whether it belongs. And when the Vutulu was in charge and he engaged in this discourse about the Ottoman legacy, that in the 16th century, the Balkans was not a periphery, but the center of a very powerful polity, uh, that sent a very wrong vibe there. Uh, in the sense that it, it's a good uh, discourse to be consumed domestically in Turkey for a variety of reasons, and I don't have time to go into that, but it erupted the region the wrong way. Uh, not just uh, Serbia, which is the, the, the or Serbs, the, the usual suspects, but also uh, Albanians, when Erdogan said that uh, Kosovo is Turkey, uh, kind of ignored the way Albanian nationalism uh, is constructed with uh, the Ottomans as, as the other. Uh, so some of that uh, rhetoric of Turkey about history, the past and belonging is, is problematic. But uh, all things said and done, um, I don't see it uh, as, a, as a big issue whether Turkey belongs or, or not. It's just a fact of life and, and societies, but also political elites have gone along with it. Thank you very much. Tina. Yes, thank you. So the question about uh, whether, whether there is a shift in the value-based uh, mm. rules. Um, right, so we are seeing to a certain extent that some of the, uh, of the deals in which the U Emirates were involved in are now taken by other of those non-Western actors. We're seeing that there is interest from China to uh, take over the uh, stake in, Et in Serbia that was previously of Etihad. So there is, you know, to a certain extent, this argument that uh, these, uh, um, this uh, gray area and those deals that uh, are covered by um, in more controversy are easier to be done in a context of this personalized top-down approach than with countries from the West. And yet, uh, I should highlight, this is not always the case. Uh, there are cases of uh, Western companies also not behaving so well uh, in the Balkans. So, you know, to a certain extent, you could say this gray area, yes, does allow for um, uh, a steer away from the value-based approach of EU conditionality and towards, uh, towards this more informal way of, uh, of conceiving business. At the same time, I think that the important thing to highlight really here is that uh, from the perspective of, uh, of um, uh, the Western Balkan politicians, uh, there is no choice between the East and the West. Everything goes. Um, so they pick the actor that is most useful for them in that moment. And very often we see a, a very, um, yeah, a careful balancing act. Um, we could see one last September when uh, Alexander Vucic signed uh, the, uh, that agreement uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., um, that Vuk was also talking about. In that agreement, there were, at face value, some, uh, um, uh, some, some issues that would have uh, uh, damaged the position of Serbia vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China. But we see that the relationships between relationship between China and uh, and Serbia have not deteriorated. So we see that there is this this balancing uh, act. Um, so just to the question, I've seen uh, will the UAE's interest in the Western Balkans fade away once the countries there join the EU? Uh, unfortunately, I do not think this is going to happen anytime soon. So uh, this is this is a question that answers itself. I will I will pass on the words to Luke. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Now about uh, a question for Iran, I think uh, this is a very uh, important one and there is there was also one question about the potential uh, risks uh, for uh, Albania, so I think that I can even uh, fuse those uh, together for that uh, matter. Now the concern about the Iranian factor played a part uh, post-2012 uh, attack by uh, Hezbollah in uh, Bulgaria. So Israel, and uh, not only that happened, but we also had a lone wolf uh, attack by a milit by lit militant with an AK-47 against the uh, U.S. Embassy in uh, Sarajevo back in 2012. So this instilled fear in among uh, Israeli national security elites that the, the Balkans is always uh, a vulnerable uh, target. And this concern about Iran played a role, and uh, they were particularly concerned that there are ma too many easy targets, whether it's Israeli tourists or Israeli embassies or... Uh, Israeli investments, and they were largely concerned that uh, local intelligence agency, while they, uh, while the Israeli counterparts believe that they are uh, well-intended uh, professionals, they didn't believe that they have the operational and uh, analytic capacity to deal on a daily basis with a sophisticated adversary like uh, Iran or uh, Hezbollah. 
Now, of course, Iran has a history in the Balkans. I mean, first, its uh, activities uh, during the Bosnian War with uh, various jihadi groups. And, uh, but uh, this uh, influence has been somewhat decreased. I mean, NATO spent a significant amount of its time when it was implementing uh, its Dayton Peace Accord uh, of uh, dismantling Iranian back groups. And uh, during 2014, we had several arrests of uh, Iranian affiliated uh, individuals in both of the two Bosnian uh, entities, in both uh, Muslim Croatian Federation as well as in the Serbian enti entity Republika Srpska. And um, Iran most of the times uses, uh, but there is still Iranian influence, and uh, it uses uh, the fact that the uh, Shia Sunni divide is not so pronounced uh, in the Balkans as in other parts uh, of the world. Now, how much, uh, how much is uh, the Balkans vulnerable? I, uh, it all depends on uh, how volatile the relations between Iran and uh, the regional uh, Middle Eastern players like uh, Iran or uh, Saudi Arabia are. I mean, we have uh, seen uh, the two most vulnerable countries are uh, Bosnia and Albania, in my humble opinion. Now, Bosnia, because two Iranian adversaries are present in Bosnia, Saudi Arabia, which is quite active uh, in, uh, in Sarajevo, in Muslim uh, populated parts of the country and Israel, which is active in uh, Republika Srpska. So that is number one target, but the number one, which is particularly vulnerable is uh, Albania. And that was particularly pronounced during uh, Trump's year when uh, Rudy Giuliani and uh, John Bolton were uh, lobbying on, beha on behalf of uh, MEC, Mujahedin and Kalk. And uh, Kalk, uh, this is a militant anti-regime uh, organization from Iran whose uh, many members uh, were moved to Albania by uh, the Obama administration. I mean, and this was negotiated by uh, Hillary Clinton. I mean, how uh, if Iran decides to lash out uh, against any of these two countries, that, that actually depends on uh, how much uh, its regime uh, feels uh, threatened. If it feels that the US is plotting a regime change in the Middle East with the likes of uh, Israel or Saudi Arabia, they will try to lash out against their adversaries wherever they can. And on that front, Balkan is not the most likely target, but it is always a possible uh, target on that front. We will see how things unfold now uh, and what will be the state of this relationship now with the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken in play. Thank you very much, Fook. Well, regrettably, uh, we've reached the end of our allotted time. Uh, inevitably, that means a lot of our participants who've been <laughs> very good and stuck with us right through to the end and asked some very interesting questions. I will not have their questions uh, put, but we'll take those into consideration. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for finding the time uh, to join us. Uh, we do appreciate that. Um, there's a short feedback form, which you can see will, on your screen, which will appear in your browser when the event is over. So we would like you to uh, evaluate um, this proceeding. Um, and I'd like to thank again uh, our uh, associates, the, the RATSU uh, Forum and the Belgrade Centre for Security Policy for being our partners in this venture. We hope that this partnership will continue into the future. So thanks again to everyone involved and I hope very much you'll join us for our next endeavour. Goodbye for now. Bye, thank you.